So uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Patty Jones. I'm the Associate Director for Research uh, here at the Beckman Institute. And welcome to the first of our uh, Beckman Directors uh, Seminar Series for the fall 2021 semester. As you may know, this series has been going on ever since Beckman was founded um, as a way to bring together our community and have faculty members from the Beckman Institute talk about their research in a little bit more accessible way to a broader audience. Um, before I actually introduce today's speaker, I would also like to say that um, we here at Beckman would like to start a new habit. Uh, this is something that we have not been doing, although um, it's been out there in the campus environment for a while. And that is to say that I'd like to start off uh, the seminar by uh, reading the land acknowledgement statement from the University of Illinois. Um, so therefore, I would like to begin by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskazia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscotin, Odawa, Sac, Meskaaki, Kickapoo, Powatami, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the people of these lands as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed the growth of this institution for the past 150 years. We are obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role that this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and centering of native peoples is a start as we move forward for the next 150 years. Thank you. So um, now I am pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, as you can see from his title slide already up on the screen, uh, Professor Chan will talk about his research. Um, congratulations to Jeff for being recently promoted to associate professor in the Department of Chemistry. He's also an affiliate in the Department of Biochemistry and of course an affiliate of the Beckman Institute. At Beckman, here he leads the Photoacoustic Imaging Working Group and is also affiliated with our Multimodal Vascular Imaging and Neurotechnology for Memory and Cognition Working Groups. Uh, he earned his PhD from Simon Fraser University and was a postdoc at UC Berkeley before joining U of I in 2014. And as we'll hear about today, uh, his research investigates disease states characterized by molecular level changes that occur before detectable symptoms manifest in the body. Chemical probes designed to image these molecular processes can help detect and diagnose diseases at an early stage, provide insights into the progression and maximize opportunities for treatment. Um, as you can see from the title today, uh, he'll, today he'll discuss strategies employed to, to construct state-of-the-art photoacoustic imaging probes that generate ultrasound signals from light. So please join me in welcoming Jeff. Um, if you have clarifying questions uh, as we're talking, please put them in the chat. Um, I will interrupt Jeff if we have a question about something that people really wanna understand. Otherwise, I will look at the chat questions and we'll probably save questions for the end of the seminar. So with that, welcome aboard and thank you, Jeff, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Patty, and thank you everybody for joining me. It's a great honor to be able to share the work that I've been doing uh, at Illinois since 2014. And so today, what I wanted to talk about was one is one branch of work in our research group, which is developing chemical tools to image disease biomarkers for various applications. So why exactly are we interested in imaging disease states, such as cancer, for instance? And one of the reasons is we want to develop these chemical probes to be able to study and understand their complex nature. So the molecular basis of these diseases are really hard to study, especially in its native in vivo context. And developing these chemical tools will allow us to peer to see and, and you know, really study what's invisible to the naked eye. So that's one of the things that we do. The other reason, which is why I'm gonna focus a little bit more on today is potential human applications. We wanna be able to develop tools that can improve patient survival through imaging. And what I'm showing here are some statistics for common cancer types, prostate, ovarian, breast cancer, and lung cancer. And as you can see from this data, if we're able to detect these various cancer types at an early stage, survival is actually not too bad. In the case of prostate cancer, almost every single patient survives. However, when the tumor begins to spread and disseminate through the body, such as in stage four lung cancer, the survival rates really drop, and we hope to be able to be able to contribute to this long-term. Now, our approach is known as molecular imaging. And what exactly that means is the ability to look at a cellular or a molecular process. Now, this could be a aberrant enzymatic activity that perhaps has changed during a disease state that could potentially serve as a biomarker. This could be the accumulation of metal ions, such as copper or another different species, or the production of small molecule analytes, such as hydrogen peroxide, nitric oxide, and the list goes on. And so generally speaking, the way we approach this is we develop these smart molecules called chemical probes 
they're equipped with a target responsive functional group that we call a trigger shown in blue. And the reason why we develop these triggers is that by appending them onto our molecule, we can actually attenuate the signal. So what I wanna draw your attention to is that these smart molecules start off with a low signal. Now these triggers shown in blue are designed such that when they interact with the imaging target, which could be one of these biomarkers, there's some type of change. A chemical reaction takes place, maybe something happens to the trigger. And through this chemical reaction, we lead to a high signal change. So again, going from a low signal to something that's higher to allow us to see something that's actually, you know, again, invisible to the naked eye under normal circumstances. Now, we utilize a variety of different techniques for these applications, and I'll highlight some of them, and I'll provide the motivation of why we use ultrasound detection as one of the outputs. So one of the approaches that we utilize is fluorescence imaging. And if you're familiar with fluorescence imaging, you know, this is a really powerful approach, especially when you're equipping it with these small molecule fluorophores that can be used to visualize subcellular components, some of these processes that I had spoken about previously, and because they're able to highlight a cell and provide color. There are some limitations and that has to do with imaging depth, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. But on the fluorescence front, I wanna highlight some of the molecules that we've developed using a chemical approach that we call activity-based chemical activation. And what this basically means is we're leveraging the unique chemistry of the disease biomarker that we're interested in sensing to afford some type of unique chemistry to give us that off-on signal enhancement that I was talking about. So here's an example in the top left corner. This was one of the first papers that we published when we arrived at Illinois. And in this instance, we were interested in sensing formaldehyde. The idea behind this is once formaldehyde reacts chemically with this molecule, you get a signal enhancement. And this is the first time that this was possible. Prior to this, you would have to take some cells, homogenize them, derivatize them, and perhaps analyze them in a less efficient way. Our system works with live cells. Here's another example of this activity-based chemical approach that I'm talking about. So we're, we're trying to detect nitroxo, which is HNO, another really difficult species to detect. And the reason for this is because as it's being produced, it's instantaneously being consumed by biological proteins, biological species. So what we've done is in this case, we've taken um, the, the, the knowledge and the principle from physical organic chemistry, and we've leveraged effects like the Thorpe Ingold that allows us to cyclize our molecule faster we're taking advantage of things like the alpha nucleophile effect. These don't really matter that much, but what does matter and what is important is we're able to outcompete all these endogenous thiospecies for reactivity, allowing us to sense HNO even at very low abundance. We've developed a pair of reagents to look at stem cell activity. So these molecules are called al uh, green allicense and red allicense respectively. And what we're targeting is an enzyme that's upregulated in stem cells. And in fact, the molecule on the left-hand side is commercialized by Millipore Sigma, and so you can buy it for your studies. We've also developed a molecule that's also commercialized by Millipore Sigma. This is called Coxfluor. It's another molecule that detects and senses the elevated enzyme cyclooxygenase 2, which is the target for a lot of painkillers. And we've even developed chemical tools that will allow us to release an analyte on demand using light and allows us to read and, and tell you how much is being released based on a fluorescent readout. So we've done a lot of these types of you know, chemical designs and chemical probes for fluorescence, but there are some limitations. Now, what I'm showing on the left-hand side is the high resolution that fluorescence imaging can afford in cell culture. But when you try to translate this into an in vivo context, the resolution really breaks down. And that's because the light has a limit of penetration. And so the reason for this can be seen in this bottom left-hand corner. Let's say we focus in on this near-infrared fluorophore that could potentially generate the signal. The excitation light first has to pass through many layers of tissue and cells. And as it's passing through, it gets attenuated and it gets scattered. Some of that light eventually will reach the fluorophore and you're generating a photon at a longer wavelength, but the light that's being emitted suffers from the same type of attenuation and scattering, such that by the time it reaches the detector, it's actually really hard to pinpoint where this fluorophore was situated within the tissue. And in fact, you can see this from some of the data that we published in a paper in 2018. This is using our stem cell probe. So in the middle are images of lung cancer stem cells. And if somebody were to ask me, how many stem cells are present? Where are they located within the lung? I wouldn't be able to tell you because the resolution is so poor. It really is a signal that's overlaid on top of this photograph. 
Likewise, here's an image of a, a, a tumor and we're detecting that stem cell activity. But again, very, very challenging to pinpoint where the signal is originating from because of these scattering and attenuation effects that plagues fluorescence imaging when you're applying it for in vivo studies. And so the question that we were faced with at the time we started was, well, how can you develop chemical tools to be able to monitor these complicated biological processes or detect these you know, really important disease biomarkers in vivo if fluorescence-based imaging has a limitation in terms of depth penetration? And this really leads us to the second imaging modality that our lab is focused on, and it's known as photoacoustic imaging. So a lot of you may already be familiar with this, but very simplistically, photoacoustic imaging can be considered as a light in ultrasound out technique, okay? And the reason why detecting sound as opposed to detecting a photon of light is potentially advantageous for in vivo studies is because sound scatters uh, much less in biological tissues and it's able to penetrate much deeper into the body. And so depending on the type of um, dye you're using or the type of instrumentation, you know, reports of up to 12 centimeters have been you know, published. And so very briefly, photoacoustic imaging, interestingly, is actually based on a phenomenon that was discovered by Alexander Graham Bell over 120 years ago in his search for uh, means of wireless communication. He wanted to be able to communicate with other humans over a long distance without having been grounded to a wire. And so he had invented and patented this instrument called the photophone. And essentially what it does is it's detecting light and converting it into sound. That's the you know, easiest way that you can think of it. Okay, and here you see a picture of Graham Bell and one of his assistants essentially using sound, using light to carry sound waves so that they can hear and talk and communicate with each other. Now, this technology never took off. And one of the main reasons for that is the stability of the light source that could carry that sound wave but it really has made a tremendous impact in biomedical imaging, as I'll show you in a little bit. But how exactly do you convert light into sound waves? So we can think about this in two ways. Now we can compare it to fluorescence imaging. Imagine we have some type of fluorophore or maybe some type of dye. You shine light on it, the light is absorbed by the molecule, it promotes electrons in an excited state, and upon relaxation of the excited state back down to its ground state, this is accompanied by an emission of a photon at a longer wavelength. Now imagine if we're able to take these molecules, okay, and chemically tune them or chemically trick them such that they can still absorb the light, they can still be promoted into an excited state, but now they can't relax back down to emit a photon. What happens to that energy that's being absorbed? Well, it actually is released very rapidly in its surrounding as heat. And if this happens, in a, a in a, a pulsed manner, you're essentially generating pressure, generating pressure waves that we can perceive and detect as ultrasound. So very briefly, another example is, let's say you go on the internet and you watch a video of two objects making contact, maybe somebody's foot kicking a soccer ball, and you slow that video frame by frame, and you, the, at the moment of contact, there's transfer of kinetic energy from the foot to the ball. As the ball starts to move in the opposite direction, it's no longer spherical, it's stretched out. Now you play that video in full motion, you actually hear the disturbance of sound, right? We're essentially doing that, but at the molecular level. So very briefly, there's a number of instruments that we utilize in our group, one of which uh, the schematic is shown here. The components are, are pretty much consistent. So you have a pulse laser that will excite um, you know, your, your specimen, and you have these gray little dots here. These are ultrasound transducers. So upon excitation, what you get is that local temperature rise that I described, and subsequently the generation of pressure waves that we can detect and reconstruct as three-dimensional images in very high resolution. So here's a representative image of a, a tumor. And so some of the advantages of using photoacoustic imaging is first and foremost, you're using very safe non-ionizing light. Okay, and this is an advantage over techniques that utilize radiation, for instance. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, we're dealing with potentially clinically relevant penetration depths, and the resolution is really high. The resolution is dependent on depth, but as you can see from some of the examples here, you can look at the mouse vascular the ear, the mouse vasculature in a mouse ear, you know, very clearly. Um, you can use this to detect, you know, small tumors such as a melanoma that might be missed by other techniques, and you can non-invasively look through the skull to look at regions of the brain that are devoid of oxygen. Now, when we started in this area, the field had focused you know, predominantly on using endogenous biomarkers to generate contrast. And what an endogenous biomarker is, is something like a pigment that's found naturally in your body, 
like hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin in blood, or maybe melanin in skin. And you can see it, it works really well, right? There are some limitations in terms of using this to diagnose the disease, for instance. You're hoping for some type of contrast or some type of change between healthy and diseased tissue, but you can't really tell a pigment to localize to a particular area. You're just hoping that that difference already exists. So to combat this, the field also focused on developing contrast agents. So very briefly, these can be any type of imaging agent that is always in an on state. So what that means is the signal is high before engaging its target, and it's also high after engaging its target. And it's typically directed to the tissue or the disease cell using some type of receptor mediated uptake pathway. So there are some disadvantages. The first is because if they're always in an on state, they're always generating a photoacoustic signal, and this potentially can lead to a high background. Secondly, in terms of molecular imaging, it's typically recognizing surface biomarkers. So you are performing molecular imaging, but you're missing on all those other, um, you know, elevated enzymes, metals, reactive species that I talked about earlier. You're really recognizing maybe a protein or, or you know, some type of biomarker on the surface. And so this is where we thought we can contribute. So we thought maybe we can make these smart probes that we ended up calling acoustogenic molecules. And what they are is they're smart molecules that start off quiet. They're equipped with that trigger that I talked about. And they're and upon engaging the analyte or the disease biomarker of interest, some type of activity-based chemical activation takes place to make the molecule louder. So you go from a low signal to a high signal. And this allows us to perform the imaging instantaneously upon administering this into the body or into a subject. You don't have to wait for accumulation or you don't have to wait for clearance before you can start. And so we explored a lot of different design principles to be able to generate these types of probes. And I'm gonna tell you one general approach that we utilize. So you might ask, well, how exactly do you control sound production? So what really determines the strength of the photoacoustic signal? There's a lot of parameters, but what we decided to target is the extinction coefficient, which can be thought of as how much light a molecule or a particle can absorb at a given wavelength, right? And we further hypothesize that maybe if we can take a near-infrared molecule and we can equip it with a trigger that's electron withdrawing or electron with deficient, deficient, you're essentially pulling electron density away from this conjugated pi system. And this should lead to a blue shifted absorbance that's still in the near infrared range for deep tissue penetration, but it's blue shifted. Now, we also hypothesize that perhaps we can design these triggers such that upon reaction with the disease biomarker, they change in a way that now they're more electron rich. So if you have an electron donating group or an electron rich group, you can donate electron density into the conjugated pi system. And if you recall from organic chemistry one, you know, this can actually lead to resonance structures that flattens out the molecule, leading to better overlap of orbitals. And this results in a red shifted absorbance. Now imagine if we came in with a light source exciting at this wavelength, you would generate a photoacoustic signal that corresponds to the probe. If I came in with a second wavelength of light, I would generate a photoacoustic signal that predominantly corresponds to the probe. The ratio of which is really powerful because it allows us to calibrate and control for a lot of potential imaging artifacts. Now, why exactly are we developing these types of probes? What are we targeting? As I said earlier, one of the reasons is because we want to study the complex nature of diseases such as cancer. And we're, we're really trying to target you know, the tumor microenvironment or properties of the tumor microenvironment. And this is described as where cancer cells reside. And this has really emerged as an extremely important and hot topic because physicians, scientists are starting to recognize that some cancer treatments such as immunotherapy work really well in some patients and completely fail in others because of differences in the tumor microenvironment. The problem is looking at these molecular level features non-invasively is very, very challenging because there's a lot of different cell types. There's these gradients of oxygen, gradients of pH that are established, and you really just don't have the methods to be able to profile them. And so we thought, you know, if we're trying to understand these disease states, this would be a really good starting point. So to give you an idea of some of the molecules we've developed, we've developed probes that could target uh, metal ion dysregulation. So these couple examples target copper two, which is elevated in a lot of solid tumors, such as breast cancer. 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about this story uh, in, in a couple minutes. But oxygen availability is a property of um, you know a lot of solid tumors, and we want to be able to study this you know in a non-invasive manner. So we've developed a lot of molecules that could you know uh, do this. Nitric oxide is a reactive small molecule that, again, is so incredibly difficult to detect in an in vivo context because it's so reactive. It changes into different forms. And in, especially in the context of cancer, it's really complicated because it plays a dichotomous role. At the onset of cancer, your body's producing a lot of nitric oxide, trying to kill those cells. And at some point, the cancer will hijack cells that produce this, generate and release low-grade levels of nitric oxide, so you cause an inflammatory response to drive tumor progression. Detecting this and studying this was really hard, but we have molecules to do this right now, and we've actually gained a lot of insight. And we've also developed molecules that you can actually donate and deliver nitric oxide in a controlled manner. Remember, these are highly reactive molecules that you can't really store, but we can use near infrared light delivered on demand, and we can actually use photoacoustic imaging to be able to calibrate tell, and tell you where this is being delivered and how, how much. Now, what I want to do for the next, um, you know, 25, 30 minutes or so is I want to tell you three case studies in our group where we're focusing more on that second application, which is applications that will potentially lead to the improvement of human health, okay? And one of the earliest stories was in collaboration with Professor DeBerke's laboratory at Beckman. And, you know, when I first became a member of the Beckman Institute and I met with Professor Jeff Moore, he had told me something that really resonated with me. He told me there's so many opportunities for collaboration. And I asked him, well, how, how do I do this? He said, well, you know, just, just come to Beckman, go to meetings, talk to people, and you'd be surprised. And to be very honest, I'm very grateful to Professor DeBerke because, you know, without him, without him, you know, early on contributing and really, you know, helping us with this work, you know, we wouldn't have advanced as quickly as we did. And this is some of the work that we did together. So we're interested in developing probes to sense hypoxia, which is described as a condition where the demand of oxygen is outweighed by the supply that's available to tissue. And in the context of cancer and a lot of diseases, this is a really big problem because if you have hypoxic tumors, you get a lot more angiogenesis. So the formation of blood vessels, um, these tumors are typically, you know, they have high metastatic potential, very, very aggressive, you know, uh, aggressive phenotypes, and they have a tendency of being treatment resistant. Okay. So the actual application that we were interested in is we wanted to be able to use hypoxia to stage prostate cancer. Now, the reason is because prostate cancer is known as one of the most aggressive um, you know, tumor types that correlate well with hypoxia. And in fact, as you can see here, going from stage one to two to three, the extent of hypoxia increases. Now, in fact, physicians have tried to use this to stage prostate cancer. And the way that they do it currently is the gold standard, in, which is the application of these polygraphic needle electrodes. So the way that they work is with the assistance of ultrasound, transrectal ultrasounds guided imaging, you insert these needles directly into the prostate and the area that makes contact with the tissue, you can directly read the oxygen content. Now, there's a couple of disadvantages of this. The first is this is highly invasive, right? We're taking a needle and we're actually inserting it into tissue. So ideally we'll wanna avoid that. The second limitation is that you're only sampling a very small um, you know, region of the tumor. As we know from properties of the tumor microenvironment, it's heterogeneously you know, displayed, which means that you can get false positives, you can get false negatives. And in order to map out hypoxia in the prostate, you would have to take this needle and poke a lot of times. And that's something that we definitely want to avoid. And so there was a call in the field for the development of novel new techniques that are non-invasive that will be able to provide all this information without having to use these invasive polygraphic needle electrodes. And this is where we thought we could contribute. <clears throat> and so going back to the design that I talked about a little bit earlier, here we have this azobodipine urine for a dye. And as I said, we wanted an R1 group, a trigger that's electron withdrawing to give us this blue shifted absorbance. And we wanted to change it after it's interacted with some property of hypoxia so that it changes to be um, more electron donating, giving us the shift in absorbance. But what exactly is R1 and R2 going to be? What is that blue circle and what is that red circle? So we took inspiration from a hypoxia activated prodrug known as AQ4N. And what I want to draw your attention to are these orange functional groups right here. This is an N oxide. So you have a positively charged nitrogen that's attached to a negatively charged oxygen. This was extremely appealing to us because it can interact 
with cytochrome P450s that are found throughout your body that doesn't require overexpression under tumor conditions. So this is really advantageous. Normally what happens is when you have a lot of oxygen around, oxygen can actually coordinate and interact with the iron center of the cytochrome P450s, okay? However, under hypoxic condition, when the oxygen isn't present, these N oxide groups can interact with the iron center. And this triggers a nitrogen to iron oxygen transfer event, giving us these amine functional groups. And this molecule is now activated. It's highly, um, you know, highly cytotoxic and it's a topical isomerase two inhibitor. So we hypothesize, you know, perhaps we can install N oxide functional groups onto this position of our dye to give you, um, you know, a, a certain property that's associated with the probe and our hypoxic conditions, you know, it would change the properties. And you don't have to really look at the data. All you have to do is look at, you know, these images, right? So these are the same concentration of the probe, which we named hype one and the turnover product, which we call red hype one. And you see the hypothesis was true, was validated. You know, there's drastically different colors. This absorbs at 672 nanometers. The turnover product absorbs at, you know, 760. These, both of these molecules have high extinction coefficients, which is important for harvesting that light to generate this photoacoustic signal. And we purposely designed these molecules such that they're both relatively fluorescent. And this is important when you're developing new technology. And this was at the time when we started this, because we can use multiple multimodal imaging, both fluorescence and photoacoustic, to do a head-to-head -head comparison to be able to you know, introduce this technology to the field. And here's the absorbance shown in the solid blue and red line. And as you can see, if I were to excite at this wavelength right here, I would generate a signal that corresponds to the turnover product, but you don't get any type of interference because that blue line doesn't, absor doesn't extend to this region right here. And therefore, if we were to excite at 770 nanometers and we generate a photoacoustic signal as shown here, then we're confident that we're actually looking at a hypoxic state. And so over the years, we've utilized a large number of different model systems to be able to test our probe. In fact, the bioimaging department at Genentech had made you know, 20, 30 grams of this molecule and they used it to test hypoxia responses in some of their drug molecules. But I'm gonna highlight our first experiment that we did with the Diverki lab. And so what we learned to do was we learned to implant 4T1 tumor cells into the flank of these animals. We waited several weeks for the tumors to grow to sufficient size. And what we did was we performed systemic administration of our imaging agent and we performed photoacoustic imaging after one, three and five hours. Now, I wanna draw your attention to this top row right here, okay? These signals are coming from the control flank that is not bearing the tumor you're still seeing this background signal because this is coming from those endogenous pigments that I talked about that's generating the signal. But what's important to note is when you quantify these, the intensity of the signals, they're shown here in blue. There's really no change because this region has plenty of oxygen. You know, it's not hypoxic. Now, if I can draw your attention to the bottom row, this is, um, these are images of the tumor. As you can see before injection, one hour, two hours, three hours and so forth, the signal is increasing as a function of time. It tends to plateau after around three hours or so. And here's just a, a video um, showing, oops, sorry about that. Here's just a video uh, showing you uh, what you know, some of these uh, images look like. And so if I can click this right here, you can see you know, you're able to get very, very high resolution um, images using this technique. Now this is in comparison to um, you know, the, the use of our, our, you know, our fluorescent molecules where the resolution is significantly poor. And I'm, I'm just gonna skip through that data, but I wanna focus on something that's really important, okay? After we had established this, um, you know, this first molecule and we published this work you know, jointly, we wanted to use our chemical tuning to be able to improve two important properties. The first is we wanted to be able to shift the absorbance of both of these species into the imaging window. Because remember, at the very beginning, I talked about erasure metric imaging, being able to excite at two distinct wavelengths. But what you'll see in these dotted blue lines is the absorbance maxima of hype one actually falls outside that window. Now, of course, we can change the laser source, but as a chemist, we hypothesize that we can actually chemically tune this. So the way that we did this is we thought by replacing this OME group, this methoxy group, with something that's even more electron rich, you can actually push electron density into the conjugated pi system. 
And if you're able to do that, we should be able to shift the wavelength of a maximum absorbance into the imaging window. And that's exactly what we're able to do. So now you can excite at two different wavelengths to get that you know, advantageous property that I mentioned earlier. Now, with this probe, we can actually now do um, imaging on these tumors, but the major difference is because we're able to image at multiple wavelengths, this red signal is no longer coming from those endogenous pigments that I described earlier. This is unactivated probe. So this is regions of the tumor that have oxygen. And these green regions right here are your hypoxic regions. So these are the tissue that is devoid in oxygen. And we can actually go in there, you know, determine the volume, determine the extent where this is localized and so forth, all because we're able to do this ratiometric imaging. The second thing that we wanted to improve is we wanted to improve the signal output. And the reason is because if you're able to reduce the amount of imaging agent you use, your overall experiment is gonna be more biocompatible. But if you look at the chemical structure of some of our molecules, they're pretty large already. They're pretty lipophilic. And one way that's very common to increase the extinction coefficient, which correlates to the photoacoustic signal, is to add more double bonds, to add more rings. If we were to do this to our system, we'd probably make our molecule less and less biocompatible, less and less you know, soluble, making it more difficult to formulate. So we hypothesized a very simple solution. We thought, well, what if we can introduce a minimal perturbing ethylene bridge as shown in red and blue? Effectively, what we can do is we can lock these rings from rotating too much. And by doing so, you're increasing the orbital overlap. And that simple modification should shift the wavelength of maximum absorbance, as well as increase the coextinction the extinction coefficient to give us a stronger photoacoustic output. And this is exactly what we saw. So we were able to rationally develop these. We found that putting a methylene bridge on the side of the molecule that does not bear your trigger gives you the best response. And we call these molecules uh, confirmationally restricted azobodipes, or CRAB for short. And what they give us is this massive over 100 nanometer shift. So now that increases our dynamic range. The photoacoustic output is improved three and a half to four fold. And we've been able to show that this is generalizable. We're able to apply this to all the different imaging agents that we've developed. Now, with all of these improvements, you know, I want to get back to prostate targeting. So one of the um, biomarkers that we wanted to target and leverage is prostate-specific membrane antigen. And we can do this by attaching this inhibitor-based targeting group um, by appending it into our molecule. And so when you do that, the uptake into cells that are overexpressing or, or you know, displaying this biomarker has a tendency to take up our molecules quite well. So I can draw your attention to this column right here. These are HEC293 T cells that are PA, PSMA negative. And after one hour incubation, you really don't see too much signal. Uh, after 24 hours, you see a little bit, but this is really just non-specific staining. When you change out the media, this washes away. However, if you look at um, you know, the cell line lawn cap, which is PSMA positive, you see very robust uh, staining patterns and you know, the uptake of the, the target it, you know, works really well. And so, you know, just to kind of tell you where we are right now, we've been able to outfit uh, a panel of our imaging agents that still retain its responsiveness to hypoxia, but now they're able to target prostate cancers and we're able to image these tumors you know, very effectively. And one of the really cool things about you know, this particular project is we're not the only people that are interested in developing um, you know, photoacoustic technologies to, to stage prostate cancer. So we have a longstanding collaboration with Professor Junji Yao at Duke University, who's also interested in this, but they approach it from the instrumentation front. And so what he's done is he's taken these ultrasound scanners that are available in every single hospital setting, and he's equipped it with a light source that integrates really well with our imaging agents. And the hope is that we can perform this type of imaging that would typically be done on a prostate cancer patient anyways, but now you're getting all this rich molecular information with regards to hypoxia. And this is something that you know, we're still actively pursuing and very excited about. Now, I wanted to quickly switch gears very quickly to the second application that I wanted to talk about today, which is, you know, can we use photoacoustic imaging to replace invasive procedures such as a biopsy? Now, the original reason why we became interested in this particular disorder called Wilson's disease, which is characterized by a mutation of a, a protein exporter uh, for copper, is because we're interested in studying aging. And this was a really good model for that. But 
What Wilson's disease is characterized is accumulation of copper ions in the brain and predominantly in the liver. As you know, copper can actually cause a lot of toxic effects, such as the production of free radicals if left unchecked. And so a lot of Wilson's disease patients um, will actually you know, suffer a lot of liver damage, you know, brain damage, and so forth. And so one of the ways that you can treat this is to use a copper chelator to try and, you know, like sequester and block some of the effects, but you have to be able to monitor the dosing. And the way that you typically do this is you do these liver biopsies. And we ask the question, you know, can we replace this using photoacoustic imaging probe development? And so very briefly, what we did was we utilized a very similar azabodipi system. And we're using the chemistry that I talked about earlier, which is activity-based chemical activation. And in this sense, what it does is we have this um, you know, chemical group right here. It binds to copper one, and it actually exploits the chemical reactivity of that copper ion, in this case, redox chemistry. Well, so what happens is copper one changes into the copper two as shown in red, and it cleaves this bond. And again, we're getting this change in absorbance, allowing us to selectively irradiate each of these species to tell us how much of copper is being, you know, is present, um, you know, how much of the probe is being activated. Okay, and so in order to develop a molecule like this that can potentially replace an invasive procedure, it's critical to show that it's safe and not harmful to the body because a lot of patients with Wilson's disease, you already have compromised liver. And the last thing that you want is your, your molecule that you're using for imaging to have some type of uh, liver toxicity. So here is just a representation of some of the studies that we've done. And we start off by looking at various liver cell lines to look at their toxicity. And we show even after extended uh, incubation at various concentrations, there really no impact on cell proliferation. Uh, we looked at immunohistostaining, uh, various stains uh, to show that there's no difference between the treatment um, you know, using our imaging agent, which we call, call PACQ1 um, or a vehicle control. And we also performed a pretty comprehensive liver function uh, you know, panel. So we're looking at a lot of different biomarkers such as alkaline phosphatase, uh, bilirubin you know, levels, cholesterol. And in every single instance, there's no you know, significant impact when whether we're treating um, you know, the, the livers with or the animals or subjects with um, uh, you know, a vehicle control or imaging agent. So this gave us a lot of confidence to proceed forward, but we had to answer the question, can our imaging agent detect copper? And so the way that we approached this is, um, you know, we supplemented copper uh, into these animals to see if there was a difference in the intensity. And so what we, I can draw your attention to is uh, this plot on the bottom left-hand corner. So if you take our imaging agent and you supplement, um, you know, with copper, you see this signal enhancement as shown here in the liver. Uh, when you don't supplement with copper, you know, this is just background signal you know, coming from, um, you know, the endogenous pigments I mentioned. Um, if you use a copper chelator, such as tetrathiamolybdate, um, this blocks the effect. And we also, you know, very frequently design control molecules that resemble our probe, but lack some type of functionality. So this is a non-responsive control. And again, we don't see any type of signal enhancement. So this gave us a lot of confidence, you know, that we're able to detect copper in the liver. And so how does this compare with a biopsy treatment? So here's the, the, the data for you know, a biopsy analysis. And here is this non-invasive uh, biopsy-free assay that we ran using our imaging agent. And you can see we get this very similar type of results. There is one major difference though, and I think our technique is actually more advantageous. And that is obviously biopsies are invasive, but more importantly, for a biopsy assessment, you're actually looking at the complete total copper content that's present in the liver that's not the copper that actually causes damage. The copper that's actually causing damage is what we call labile copper. This is copper that's associated with binders like glutathione. And so our imaging agent exclusively tells you how much labile copper is present. So I, I, you know, I, I would like to argue that this is even more reliable. And so can our imaging agent detect a patient you know, that, is, that has Wilson's disease on, can we use this to assess the level? And so what we did was we designed two unbiased blind studies and I'm gonna talk about one of them. So basically what we did is we had two groups of animals. Um, one is a wild type healthy control group and the second is a Wilson's disease group, okay? 
And so what we did was we randomly picked animals from both of these groups, we tagged them and we randomized them. So we have no prior knowledge to which is which. They visually look you know, the same. And then only applying the imaging agent that we developed to do this biopsy-free assessment, we're able to you know, determine which of these animals fall within this diagnostic threshold um, that we are hypothesizing are the healthy individuals and you know, which are the animals um, that are Wilson's disease animals. So in this particular case, we had seven animals that were healthy, one that was a Wilson's disease patient. And in every single case, we were correct with greater than 99.7% accuracy just using our imaging agent. So this was really a nice finding. And as I mentioned, we had a second like, you know, blinded study to be able to validate these results. And you know, this was really nice to see. And what we're currently using these imaging agents for now is to you know, kind of revisit our, our interest in studying the, the impact of copper dysregulation regulation and aging. And we have some really cool discoveries on that front as well. Now, in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about, you know, some recent work um, that was recent, that, that will, that's due for publication, in, I think, uh, a week or so. And what we're interested in is, can we use these photoacoustic probes to serve potentially as imaging-based companion diagnostics? So what a companion diagnostic is, is typically in vitro test that physicians will use to determine whether or not a patient has a biomarker that's necessary for drug activation. And the goal is to be able to match a patient with the right type of treatment for personalized or precision medicine. And so the goal here is what you see in, in the top left-hand corner is a number of, you know, maybe cancer patients. And what we hope is we can use our imaging agent to say, okay, these Orange patients have, you know, a certain biomarker, they should be taking this orange drug, you know, these blue cancer patients have a different biomarker, maybe they should be taking this blue drug. And so this is the overall goal to be able to stratify these patients into, you know, subject groups. But the question is, what is our biomarker going to be? And in this particular instance, what we did was we really wanted to showcase our chemical tuning using this activity-based chemical activation approach that our lab you know, really utilizes a lot. And that is to target glutathione. So why glutathione? Now, glutathione is elevated in a lot of solid tumors, okay? But it's not usually viewed as the best biomarker for cancer. And the reason for that is because it's found at very, very high levels in the liver, right? It's used for detoxification. It's found at high millimolar levels in, um, you know, in healthy tissue, right? It's a part of you know, the, the redox you know, process of a lot of cells. And it's in you know, submillimolar levels in the blood. And so this is a major problem because if we took a responsive trigger that's commonly used in the field, such as this 2,4-dinitro uh, molecule shown here, and we install it onto one of our photoacoustic imaging agents, and we assess the turn on response to various levels of glutathione, you'll see that it completely activates regardless of the levels. So 10 millimolar is what's typically found in certain cancers, their full activation, you know, healthy tissue will activate it, even glutathione in the blood will activate it. So basically, if you were to put this into a patient, you get full activation everywhere. And so our approach this chemical activation approach is to use, you know, a rational tuning approach. So we hypothesize, well, this involves a substitution reaction. What if we change the electronic nature of these groups that I'm using my mouse cursor to highlight? Well, maybe if we, you know, made them more electron deficient, you would get a faster reaction. And so this is called a Hammett plot. This allows us to almost kind of build a blueprint to really understand how the reaction works. Here's another plot. These, this is called um, you know, I-ring plot. And what it tells you is that activation barrier. So everybody here has taken you know, general chemistry. We talk about the energy required for reaction. We can actually measure this very precisely to give us even further information about the reactions. And lastly, on the right, this is called a Bronson plot. This is basically our chemical blueprint. So we can use you know, a certain property of these molecules to, to make predictions. So if I wanna make something, I don't actually have to go and make it. I can make a prediction to you know, identify the best target before I go and synthesize it. And all of this leads to fine tuning. And so if you take a look at this reactive trigger that now features the floral group and a nitro group right here, I get full activation at pathological levels very little or no activation in the blood or healthy tissue. And this is exactly what we wanted to see. 
And so we're able to install this onto one of our photoacoustic platforms. We're able to validate these in a variety of different cell lines. And very briefly, what we're showing right here is our ability to sense glutathione in these A549 lung cancer cells that's very, very high in levels of glutathione. We can scavenge this. We can scavenge this to show that this is in fact, you know, related to thios using them. And as I mentioned earlier, we build these control molecules that are non-responsive by just tuning the chemistry. And again, we show that this is true. And furthermore, we can actually look at different levels in different cell lines. And we discovered that U87 brain cancer cells actually have a very, very low level of glutathione. And this is interesting because when we do validation studies using this ex vivo or in vitro test called the Elman's assay, we get this exact same results. And so this gave us a lot of confidence to proceed forward. And another thing that we want to address is, well, can we actually transform this into a drug, right? Can we turn this into a prodrug? The reason we want to do this is because chemotherapeutics, they work really well, right? But there's a limitation. And that limitation is that they're very toxic to healthy tissue. So you have to kind of find a balance. Too much of a drug, you end up killing healthy tissue or the patient. Too little leads to incomplete eradication of your cancer. And this gives that tumor, it gives those cancer cells an opportunity to mutate, to come back with resistance. And so if there's a way that you can actually dose higher or, or you know, perhaps have you know, it's targeted delivery, this should in theory give better results, right? less collateral damage. And so we synthesized a version of the molecule that's very similar to our imaging agent. And the major difference is we've included this arm right here that allows us to hook up um, a gemcitobine chemotherapeutic. And we call this molecule PARX. And so what happens is in the presence of pathological levels of glutathione, there's that reaction that takes off this part of the molecule. This leads to this cascade that eliminates the imaging agent, allowing us to confirm a result. And it also limits, uh, uh, releases the drug that should target that tumor, right? We always do rigorous validation studies to make sure that all of these bonds are stable. You're not getting off target responses. And we're able to show this on the bottom of the screen. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the targeted activation of these molecules, both the imaging agent and the prodrug. So these are photoacoustic images of the major organs um, that have been treated with a vehicle control on the bottom row or our imaging agent prodrug. And you see, if you quantify the signals, there really isn't that any difference except for in the tumor. And in fact, we can validate this by doing staining. And if you're used to looking at these types of images, you'll see that the spleen, the liver, the kidney, the heart, there really is no toxicity. There's no difference because there's not enough glutathione to activate that drug for release, right? However, this is very different in the tumor. And in fact, um, you know, we can do apoptotic assays. So this is a tunnel staining assay. And you see that with the uh, uh, imaging agent prodrug treated, you know, cells um, you know, or tissue, uh, you know, the cells that are dying through apoptosis. And so how exactly does this work in vivo? So we administer these to two uh, A549 lung cancer tumor bearing mice in two ways. The first was an intratumor injection. We just wanted to directly inject. We see a signal enhancement. The signal enhancement is telling us that the glutathione that's present, this disease biomarker that's present is in fact activating it and releasing the drug. And we further show that we get the same result when we administer systemically. So we're doing this retroorbitally and you're still getting that same type of activation because of the glutathione that's present. Now, how does this impact tumor growth and proliferation? So if I can draw your attention to the blue and black lines, these are tumors that have been treated with the imaging agent prodrug um, for this duration right here. As you can see, there's no tumor growth. These are actually dead tumor cells, dead tumors. Uh, if you treat it with a vehicle control, on the other hand, these tumors grow to be a very large size. Um, you know, the, the tumor begins to spread through the body. And you can see this visually uh, on the right-hand side right here. But what's important to note is that, you know, because our molecule is so safe, we're actually able to increase the dosing frequency as well as the dosing regimen up to the approved levels. And there's absolutely no, you know, collateral damage. There's no harm to the body. And this gave us a lot of confidence that we've been able to, to develop this imaging, you know, agent that can potentially be used as a, a diagnostic, but also a matching prodrug that responds to the same biomarker. So in the last couple of slides, I want to show you, um, you know, the, uh, a study that we conducted in design, going back to the original purpose of this, which was to develop a companion diagnostic. So what we did was we established another blind study where we implanted A549 uh, lung tumors into animals. 
which is high in the disease biomarker, and UH7 tumors that are low in the disease biomarker. The reason why we implant to tumors is because visually you can't actually tell the two different groups of animals apart, and we randomize them after we take them. And only using the imaging agent and the signal intensity that's corresponding to it do we make an assessment. So the student that performed these experiments, she um, you know, predicted that three of the animals belong to group one, which is your lung cancer group. Um, and that because of the high signal, and then five of the animals would belong to the brain cancer group. And she further hypothesized, well, if we were to treat them using our, our prodrug, um, you know, group one would have you know, complete uh, eradication of the tumor, whereas there would be absolutely no response in the brain cancer animals because they don't have that biomarker necessary for activation. And again, we we're able to predict this you know, correct every single round, of, uh, every single instance with very high degree of confidence. And so very lastly, we wanted to make sure that you know, our, our technique is clinically relevant. And so one of the major challenges of performing photoacoustic imaging is on the lung area because there's you know, air pockets, there's a lot of interference. So what we did was we generated these orthotopic tumors with the help of um, you know, uh, in, in various investigators and collaborators. And what we did was we showed that in fact, these lung tumors are growing. And now we're able to actually use photoacoustic imaging for the first time uh, to look at a disease biomarker using a small molecule probe in the lung region. And you see um, you know, this particular example, we're doing these cross-sectional images and we're doing spectral and mixing to get even you know, better, um, you know, better quality results. And you see that you know, there's very high signal uh, in the, you know, the imaging uh, companion diagnostic treated animals. And we also looked at a metastatic model as well uh, in the liver, because this is a common site of spread. And we get very, very you know, reliable results as well. Now, with that being said, you know, just to you know, conclude, um, you know, our group utilizes a variety of different imaging modes uh, beyond what I've talked about. But today I talked, told you a little bit about our fluorescence work and just to highlight you know, this approach of tuning chemistry to be able to you know, sense different disease biomarkers. And I, I told you a couple of stories um, you know, that our group has utilized, um, both in, in, the, in terms of you know, potential uh, translational applications, as well as the reasons why we're developing probes to profile the micro environment um, you know, of these tumors. And so with that being said, I wanna thank the various funding agencies that supported the work, um, the various students and coworkers um, that worked on these various projects over the years, um, you know, uh, Patty, Jeff, and everybody for you know, uh, always being very supportive and the opportunity to share my work. And thank you for your attention. I'd like to take any questions. Thank you so much. Well, wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. Virtual applause to you uh, for uh, doing a, a great talk. It was obviously full of technical information, but you explained it in a really accessible way. So even us non-chemists in the audience, um, I think have a, have a good intuitive understanding of what your lab is doing. So again, thank you so much. I do have one question in the chat um, related to electrodonating groups in HYPE-1. Um, Oliver asks, is it possible to place electrodonating groups in all para positions of the external aromatic rings to increase the maximum absorption more, or will doing this affect another property in a negative way? Hey, Oliver, thanks. That's a really great question. So it, it, there's a balance, right? Because you want sensitivity. If you install additional groups, you're actually decreasing the sensitivity of your molecule because now in order to get full activation, you actually have to activate at multiple places. Another potential drawback of that approach is that now instead of two species to worry about, which is the product and the probe, right, you have intermediates along the way. So in long story short, what we found is that placing, um, you know, these electron withdrawing triggers on the two pair positions on the bottom give you the best response and installing the second maybe boosts the signal by 15%, but it's not worth it in terms terms of, you know, the reliability and interpretation of the results. Thanks for the questions. Good question. Thank you. Um, does, does another audience member have a question? Um, if you do, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly, or you can uh, put it in the chat. So I'll pause for a couple of seconds here just to see if anybody has a question or is raising their hand. Okay, Jeff, I have one general question, which is you're talking about kind of, I haven't heard of companion diagnostics before, but I, but again, it's a method of like personalized medicine. So yes. my question is more like, 
how far are you going to human trials and are, and are the kinds of experiments you're doing informed by like FDA regulations about what it takes to prove an approach? Yeah, we're, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, that's something that I would love to do. Um, so in order to transition something from, you know, preclinical models to, to, you know, humans or anything, you know, even along those lines, you need a large talk study, um, you know, on, on larger animal systems, right? So that's something that I would love to do, um, but but not not right now currently. Um, so oh, I think some, there's a chat. Yeah, that's something that I, I think is going to be in the near future. Um, but yeah, I would love to be able to work with you know some people that are also interested in pursuing that because I think that's you know personalized or precision medicine is really the future. And I think you know the chemistry that we and many other uh, investigators. Um, do, um, you know, is really primed for this, right? You get this selectivity and you get the specificity um, that's pretty difficult to achieve, especially in an vivo context. Great, thank you. Uh, also, sorry, everybody, I forgot to let you unmute yourselves, which I just did. So we have one question in the chat, which is, have you utilized small molecule computational chemistry to assist with your molecular designs? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I actually know how to do computational chemistry myself, and I teach a lot of students. Um, some, you know, when we design our molecules, a lot of it is rational, and you can draw from a couple of different sources. Um, you know, after a while, you know, you, you can use, you know, properties of physical organic chemistry to make predictions, you can look at the literature. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense to study a mechanism or, you know, perhaps design something using computational chemistry. So yeah, we, we, we do a lot of DFT calculations as well. Um, you know, sometimes we'll do, you know, more advanced calculations through collaborations. Um, you know, we've done a lot of, you know, docking studies uh, just to see if you have an enzyme substrate, you know, how that could, um, you know, rationally inform the design of the molecules. Yeah, we definitely use, you know, any type of approach that's to our disposal. Thank you. John, go ahead. You had a question? Yeah, so, okay. Jeff, uh, this is terrific. And um, uh, I'm really impressed with how things have developed. Uh, you know, when you do many things that I thought would never be possible to do, I, I finally get impressed. So, but um, so I was just trying to keep track of the cancers that you've studied and why you chose them. So you talked about prostate cancer, lung cancer. What else did you? Um, you mean what else does our lab has our lab studied? Right, or you've studied with other people, and and why did you choose the particular ones to? Uh, to study or to match with your reagents? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It, sometimes it depends on, um, you know, like we're, we're application driven. So in the prostate cancer case, um, you know, we were interested in prostate staging to begin with. Um, so so the, that was the motivation, right? It was just the missing technology uh, that was not available. And, you know, through that, we found that, you know, a lot of different tumor types actually work, right? You know, breast cancer tumors, um, you know, are hypoxic and, and the kind of the list goes on. Um, you know, others, um, you know, it, it, like choosing a, a particular model is dependent on, um, you know, a biomarker of interest. So for instance, uh, glutathione was selected because that was something that we wanted to target, not only for the purpose of developing continuum diagnostics, but we actually have some you know, chemical biology projects where we've discovered the role of glutathione in aging that we're pursuing in the lab. And so we, we knew we were interested in you know, studying this biomarker. What are the tumor types that give us the, you know, the best chance of success, if you will, that has the highest levels of this? So for instance, lung cancer has a very high you know, level of glutathione um, you know, expression, and so does colon cancer, which is why you know, the, the grant that I was talking to, a grant application I was talking to about right. focusing on, on colon cancer for that reason. Um, you know, we've worked with other things as well, um, you know, some through collaboration, some through, you know, you know, our, our own development, but I, it, it's either application driven or it, you know, we, we develop the technology and then we're using it to, you know, discover something. So um, just one other thing about prostate cancer, because I was interested that you were, you know, going after PSMA as something elevated in prostate cancer. So the the sort of uh, urea-based uh, peptide analogs and the, I guess the phosphonamides um, are mimics of the natural substrate of that protease. And I wonder if you could use that proteolytic activity that's localized to membrane-bound PSMA to actually uh, activate some of your probes and some of your yeah. agents. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's some sort of glutaminase or something like that. But, um, 
Yeah, no, you're, yeah, I, I think your intuition's dead on. I, I, I think it would totally work. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah I, I think that's a great idea. So I might put you in contact with a former student of mine, Marty Pomper, who really okay. pioneered the PSMA pet imaging agents that are now being sort of ported to uh, alpha emitter radiotherapies. It seems to be quite, uh, quite remarkable. You know, you, yeah, you, that'd be fantastic. you make a really good case for um, selectivity being enhanced by these uh, activated imaging agents and activated locally activated therapy agents. Um, and you can contrast that with the sort of selectivity you see with pet imaging probes and target tissues and non-target tissues. And I just actually had a conversation with Marty Power recently. He said, you know, <clears throat> if you look at the sort of standardized uptake value, which is sort of a measure of target tissue uptake, the background that pet people use, you know, if you get <clears throat> three or four, you're really considered yourself a triumph. But with PSMA, you can get 40. Yeah. So it, it's such a high affinity and such a, a uh, overexpressed um, feature of, of prostate cancer. Um, and the, the, the other thing is that the pet imaging probes, which are sometimes undermined, their selectivity is undermined by a kind of filler character of the probe. <clears throat> Here you have actually a, a very non hydrophobic probing molecule, a, a urea. That, that has an animal or affinity for the target. So anyway, it, it's an unusual target. And I think, you know, it's one that could be approached uh, in many different ways, but I just wondered about the enzymatic way of using, you know, peptide substrates that might be locally activated um, in, the, in the tumor. Yeah, well, great, Jeff. Hey, thank you, John. Sure. Well, great, thank you so much. And it's lovely to see a little collaboration sprouting just now in the commentary from the audience. So that's again, what Weapon is all about, trying to make new connections and have new things happening. So once again, Jeff, I'd like to thank you so much for a wonderful okay. talk. And I believe that Beckman is recording this and we will put these on our YouTube channels. Is that right, Darren or Jenna? I believe that's what we're gonna be doing. Um, so again, people will have the opportunity to view this talk later if they happen to miss it today. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you again, Jeff. Thank you so much, and, everybody. Uh, Thanks for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.